Hi everyone, I hope everyone's healthy and well. Thank you for joining us for the next talk in our Golden Webinars and Astrophysics series. We have arranged for simultaneous language interpretation provided by Mr. Patricio Gonzalez, Director of Serendipia Soluciones, who will be simultaneously translating for us in both the English and Spanish to, and Spanish to English directions. He will now give a brief explanation in Spanish as to how to change the language for this talk, and then we'll enable the, uh, the interpretation option. Okay. Así que bienvenido todos. Para poder escuchar la interpretación al español, hay un botón en la parte inferior derecha de Zoom donde lo presionan y de esta forma pueden seleccionar la interpretación pinchando el botón español. Esto además le permite cambiar la pista de audio de la conferencia entre inglés y español. Desafortunadamente, la opción de interpretación en vivo no está disponible para las personas que utilizan Zoom en el navegador o las computadoras con Linux. Les pedimos disculpas por esto y pronto publicaremos las versiones en inglés y español de la charla en el canal de YouTube de Astrofísica UC. También sabemos que algunos participantes no pueden silenciar la pista del sonido original al escuchar la traducción al español. Esto es un error en Zoom, por lo que al salir y entrar nuevamente a Zoom se arreglaría el problema. So, welcome again. My name is Evelyn Johnston. I'm a postdoc at the Institute of Astrophysics at the Pontifica Universidad Católica. And together with Thomas Putzia, a member of our faculty and head of outreach, we will keep organizing, organizing this series of talks for as long as we can. First of all, we'd like to thank you all for the overwhelming response and, record, and encouragement that we have been receiving. We really appreciate your comments and suggestions, so please keep them coming. We will continue to bring, the, bring you these talks in the original English and with sil simultaneous Spanish translation without any registration fees. This has been made possible by the generous support for the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Our talk this evening will be given by Roger Blandford, who is the director of, well, he was the first director of the Kapli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, called CAIPAC, at uh, Stanford University. First, though, we'll give a brief introduction as to how the webinar will run. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them into the Q&A window. All viewers will be able to upload questions and comment on them, and we have a team of astronomers and journalists working behind the scenes who will be monitoring your questions and will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. The talk is expected to last for around 45 minutes, and we'll have time for questions at the end. The questions from the audience will be selected only from the Q&A window and not from the live stream on YouTube. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our other panel members who are with us today. We have Patricio and Thomas, of course. Um, from our faculty at the Instituto de Astrofisica, we have Ezekiel Trister, uh, Alejandro Clociati, and Hernan Quintana. We also have some of our students and postdocs. These are Marcela Mora, Jonathan Quirola, and Alvaro Valenzuela. And we also have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists this evening. We have Monica Rubio, who is a professor at the Department of Astronomy at the Universidad de Chile. Brian Miller, who is an astronomer at Gemini Observatory. Leopoldo Infanta, who is director of the Las Campanas Observatory, again here in Chile. Horacio Dottori, who is professor emeritus at the UFRGS in Porto Alegre in Brazil. And finally, we have Conrad Tristram and Eleanor Asani, who are joining us as astronomers from the ESO, ESO, uh, sorry, from ESO the European Southern Observatory, we both work at Cerro Paranal. And of course, we have our usual excellent team of Q&A managers, Ricardo Acevedo, Daniela Fernandez, and Carol Rojas. So it is our great pleasure to introduce Roger Blandford as our speaker this evening. Roger carried out his undergraduate and PhD studies at the University of Cambridge in the UK before moving to a postdoctoral position in Cambridge, Princeton, and Berkeley. He joined the faculty at Caltech in 1976 and moved to Stanford University in 2003 when he was appointed the first director of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. He held this position until 2013. He's now the Luke Blossom Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University and a member of the physics department. His research interests within astronomy and astrophysics are extremely wide. And during his career, he has focused on areas such as black holes, compact objects, cosmic ray physics, and high energy astrophysics, cosmology, gravitational lensing, and gravitational waves. He established the Blandford's NIAC process, which he 
which is the leading model to explain how energy can be extracted from a rotating black hole and the production of jets of plasma that travel near light speed. Throughout his career, Roger has received many awards and distinctions, including very recently the Shaw Prize in Astronomy in 2020 for his foundational contributions to theoretical astrophysics, especially towards our understanding of active galactic nuclei, the formation and collimation of relativistic jets and the energy extraction mechanisms from black holes, as well as the acceleration of particles and shocks and the relevant radiation mechanisms. So we would like to invite Roger now to tell us all about his work on the rotating black holes. Roger, please go ahead. Hi, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I think the first task is to try and share the screen and I'll see if, how that works. Can you see a PowerPoint slide? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I have to start by saying how honored I am to be giving this talk. And I'm very excited by the opportunity of talking uh, to a large audience in, in this slightly strange uh, fashion. And I know your earlier talks have, have gone very well and I've uh, been watching a few of them and I only hope I can uh, match up to the high standards that have already been uh, set. The topic that I want to talk about is uh, black hole astrophysics, and in particular, the role that rotation of the black hole may, may play in what we observe. And I, uh, I'm going to really specialize this further to talk about active galactic nuclei, although I'll try and give some indication that I th think uh, these topics are actually much more generally applicable in, in modern astronomy. So um, let me uh, move on perhaps to the first slide. And um, let me try to get there. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start slightly historically because uh, the story really begins in the late 1930s when um, this gentleman here, uh, Groot Reba, I don't know, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, so that'll have to be my pointer. Uh, he was an, an amateur astronomer in, in the United States, and he more or less developed the start of radio astronomy. And one of the brightest sources which passed, in fact, overhead for him was called, uh, it became known as Cygnus A. It's a, a, an extra galactic radio source. Um, uh, the techniques for radio astronomy developed during the Second World War, and in particular, several people, including James Hay here, um, uh, developed this further and were able to locate the source. And then it was eventually identified with a galaxy by uh, Walter Bader and others here. And then in an early attempt at doing radio interferometry, this is a technique of using more than one telescope, to make an image of a source, uh, Jenison and Daskopta, and here's Daskopta here. Um, they, this is actually their, they were able to show that this Cygnus A source had, was in two parts, and then eventually it became clear that it parts were on either side of the, of the galaxy, and you'll see more of that. As the years went by, the uh, techniques of of radio astronomy became more developed and the maps as you can see here and you'll see further uh, became more and more sophisticated and before long we knew that not only were these two lobes of emission here of radio emission here but right at the center of the galaxy was also a compact radio source and we'll see more about that meanwhile the theorists got involved and there are many people who actually figured this out but one of them is Igor Ishklovsky here and he, uh, amongst others, realized that the mechanism for making the radio waves was synchrotron radiation caused by relativistic electrons firing in a magnetic field. And then Jeff Burbage, here an Englishman, uh, was able to um, uh, deduce a minimum value for the energies involved. And it was clear that the energies were. Uh, at least as much as you would get from the rest mass of 
say 10 in the, these big sources, 10 million, uh, 10, um, 10 million suns. So they were hugely energetic and there was synchrotron radiation involved. So let's just move on to the next slide. Here's slightly more modern um, uh, pictures of, of Cygnus A. And one of the things you can see here amplifying um, what I said before is that there is actually a galaxy in the middle there, uh, what an optical astronomer would call a galaxy, and then squirting out at the center, the very nucleus of this galaxy are two linear features which we call jets and if we look at these this jets with better angular resolution using the techniques of very long baseline interferometry so this is using telescopes scattered around the world then you can see these jets in, emanate from a source on a very very small scale and we'll come back to that again i interrupt this description of cygnus a just by making one point that I, I always like to make in a talk like this, that what one has learned about these sources is not really just the gift of radio astronomers or the gift of optical astronomers and so on, but it's astronomers working together using the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And as I'm sure you all appreciate, they have at their disposal radio waves to gamma rays and for other some circumstances neutrinos gamma rays and cosmic rays these are all part of my story here and what we see with our eyes is just one octave of grand piano but we've got um 140 octaves in total to explore and pretty well all of them are actually nowadays used and they're part of the story so let's go back to cygnus a here we have Cygnus A again, and here we see another image here in the red, or uh, you see the radio emission, and then around it you can see in the blue, this is, these are the x-rays, and then here in the white there's the optical galaxy and you can see the, um, the jets that come out of the middle, the center, the nucleus of this galaxy, and then power these enormously energetic lobes of radio emission on either side of the galaxy. Moving onwards, here's another source that's famous in the history, and I've given a nod to uh, Edward Fath, who was actually a student, I think in 1908, was one of the people who realized that those spiral nebulae were in fact other galaxies containing stars, but also discovered that they had nuclei that from an optical astronomer's point of view had emission lines, so clearly there was something exciting going on in the nuclei of those galaxies. And one of the ones that he looked at uh, was not actually Perseus A, but it's another source that's very similar to it. And, uh, sorry, let me just go back that way. And, uh, and I want to show you some relevant observations, contemporary observations from Perseus A, because they again are going to be part of our story. So if we look on the very large scale, Perseus A is in a cluster of galaxies that contains a lot of very hot X-ray emitting gas. And you can see the hot X-ray emitting gas shown in orange here. Some people say that this looks like a, a skull with two eyes and a mouth and so on. But what these dark features here are, are the lobes of radio emission that have been inflated by activity in the nucleus of the galaxy and those lobes of radio emission eventually become buoyant bubbles and they float upwards in the hot gas that's in the cluster of galaxies. And if we look on the smaller scale and try and understand the uh, properties and the imaging of the jets themselves, so if we start looking again using very long baseline interferometry, uh, including, in, in fact, in this case, uh, some of the observations come from space, uh, then we are able to see the nucleus of the galaxy here, in this case, not so resolved. And then we're seeing the structure in these jets. And one of the key things is that these jets themselves, most of the radio emission shown in these, this image here, seems to come from the walls of the jets. It's like an interaction or a boundary layer that where this jet squirting out of the nucleus of the galaxy is interacting with its surroundings and it's that interaction that is giving you the relativistic electrons that are radiating synchrotron radiation um, for the gratification of radio astronomers. And so we have here the inner parts of one of these jets and if we look on the very smallest scale here too we can see these features here and this is in fact quite a common pattern in these radio sources. 
So already we have direct observational evidence that jets are formed very close to what I'm going to introduce and discuss a bit more, a black hole. So already we can see tiny structures. So I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment and talk about another source that is famous in the history uh, of astronomy, and that is Virgo A to the radio, old radio astronomers, sometimes nowadays called M87 more commonly, or M87 or 3274. It has lots and lots of names. Um, and this has, been, of course, been extremely famous for reasons that you know. Um, in 1917, um, Heber Curtis, working using the same telescope, the Lick uh, Reflector, uh, as uh, Edward Fath, uh, discovered the first jet. And you can see it here in an optical image there. Well, this isn't his image, obviously, but he actually recognized the jet. And this, in 1917 and 18, was the very first observation of such a thing. Again, we have the same pattern. It's in a cluster of galaxies, and that cluster gas is being kept hot by the uh, by the, the what comes through this jet here in the uh, from in M87. So, if we look uh, on at X-rays uh, imaging on the small scale, we can make an image of this jet with features in it. Again, if we look with radio imaging, I don't know whether I can whether this will work or not. It may do. Okay. Oh, this is, this is time-lapse photography done using by radio astronomers. And you can see, uh, if you like, uh, the um, outflow along the jet. And then here is looking on a smaller scale. And again, you see this edge brightening or interaction with the boundary layer here. So again, this is M87. Now, M87, of course, is very famous now because it was the source that was observed using the Event Horizon Telescope um, to show the famous black hole shadow. And let me just say, as I'm sure everyone on this call is very keenly aware, that the Event Horizon Telescope is anchored by ALMA. ALMA has been a glorious um, uh, telescope. It's a huge international endeavor involving uh, very actively uh, uh, South Americans, particularly Chileans, and it is uh, uh, certainly far outperformed by very high expectations for the start of it. And to be blunt, here, here, here it is in the EHT here, and uh, it is, um, I just learned about a new discovery it made this morning, and it's, um, it's been a wonderful instrument. So if you know anybody who worked on, on building this telescope, please express the thanks of so many astronomers for all the wonderful things it is continuing to discover. This is the Event Horizon Telescope. These are the combinations of telescopes that were used in the initial observations going from Antarctica and different continents and so on. And that gives us the fine image. And this is the one that's fam been famous and in all the newspapers and so on. And what is believed to see here is the is a um, essentially the shadow of the black hole in there. And the actual size of the black hole is a little bit smaller than this, but because of the bending of light, you get a large shadow. And then this is this bright ring of emission here around the around the around it. And uh, this is uh, the best best evidence of all that it's black holes that are fueling these. Um, uh, these jets and these giant double radio sources. So if we look at this in the big picture point of view, so here's M87 and uh, here's the black hole shadow. We get to larger and larger scales and if we actually go larger than the scale of the X-ray emission of the cluster of galaxies, then um, what you're seeing is this tiny black hole in the nucleus the galaxy no bigger than the solar system in its, in its physical size is influencing its surroundings on scales up to 10 billion times larger than some of the sources. In this source it's only about a billion times larger, it's influencing its surroundings. Um, so this tiny, tiny structure in the middle, which I'm going to call a black hole, is influencing uh, all that's going on around. It has an enormous environmental influence and is a major part 
of the story of galaxy formation, these very active galactic nuclei, these active black holes in the centers of, of, of these galaxies. Let's uh, move on. Let's talk next about another important source. Um, the last one I said was 3C274 was one of its names. This one is the first quasar that was discovered and it's 3C273. And it was identified as such by teamwork essentially, bringing in this multi-wavelength idea here. Here's Martin Schmidt, who took the position created by Cyril, a radio astronomer working in Australia, Cyril Hazard, took that position found the source and then realized it was a, a cosmologically distant source and therefore what was being observed was it prodigiously luminous, several hundred times the luminosity of the associated galaxy. And this was the very first quasar and this is if you like one of the powerful types of active galactic nucleus. Many of these quasars have powerful radio sources and this is no exception. Here's Here's the jets shown here in op at optical wavelengths, but we also see it on the small scale using BLBI. Um, on, um, and this is the jet observed in the 1970s. We, of course, know a lot more about it than then, but this is a lovely historical demonstration that inside this jet seen at radio wavelengths, uh, there is a radio emission. Here is the if you like the stationary part and then this feature here you can see is moving outwards and if you say that size is 30 light years and you know the time then you can quickly infer from this piece of paper that the feature here is moving 10 times faster than the speed of light and this is not a violation of Albert Einstein's special relativity it's really a consequence of simple kinematics. What happens is that this feature is coming almost towards us at nearly the speed of light. And if we work out the math, then it appears to cross the sky faster than the speed of light. And furthermore, is very much brighter than if we were looking at it from the side. And this is just a simple consequence of special relativity, not a negation of it. And that means that we um, are likely to see preferentially those sources that are pointed in our direction. There is no need for paranoia here. It really is a physical effect. Those sources where the jets are pointed towards us and have material that is flowing outwards at the speed of light are preferentially bright and therefore they're the ones that the astronomers are going to fixate on. Here's the spectrum from uh, 27A and one thing I will point out is that this is also a powerful gamma ray source and many of these sources with these jets that are pointed towards us many of these sources are also powerful gamma ray sources and that I'll come back to that point a little bit later so just to drive home the point the jets the outflows if you like are relativistic more circumstantial evidence that there's some relativity involved in the source of these jets and what better relativity can we have than the black hole and they're also in practice uh, very rapidly variable gamma ray sources again i'll return to that point a little bit now there are many many jets out there here's just a few you know of thousands and thousands of them that have been imaged i'm not going to go through all of these but be rest assured that every one of these sources has a mother who loves it and here's one um that uh was mapped, uh, was an early one in the history. This is actually a more modern map and it was actually made by my colleague Tony Reedhead who is no um, uh, stranger to Chile having worked in a CBI microwave background telescope in, um, in near San Pedro. Uh, and this, uh, and he was also responsible for this um, this image here in his team, which showed this so-called superluminal expansion. So this is a very nice, very nice one. And we can see again, these stretches are, jets are remarkably straight. Here's another one at X-ray wavelengths in picture A. You see this dead straight structure and it's created by a black hole in there. And then there's a sort of beam dump at the end. Here's a local galaxy that you know well in the Southern Hemisphere, Centaurus A. Here are other ones. Um, and they aren't just the province of quasars or active galactic nuclei, the nuclei of galaxies. We see jets all over the place. We see them in supernova remnants. Um, 
here we are, here's super, this is the crab, famous Crab Nebula, and you can see two jets in there. Here's a protostellar, famous protostellar source, image by Alma here, one of the most famous images from Alma, HL Tau, that's got jets. Here's SS433, um, a, almost certainly a black hole binary. Here's a famous neutrino source that's been in the news a lot lately. And here's the uh, uh, gravitational um, uh, wave uh, neutron star binary, GW1708-17. Again, that has a jet. And here's uh, the South African telescope. Meerkat has done a very deep field. And we can say that of the sort of AGN type of jets, there's probably a billion of them on the sky that we can see already. We're not going to name them all, but they're out there. They're extremely common. The jet business is very, very, it's a common cosmic process. It's not just some idiosyncratic uh, strange behavior. So let me segue out of the, um, um, uh, observational astronomy for a moment and go back to and go to physics now and the idea of a black hole uh, has many many sort of precedents in some sense but one of the most famous was an, uh, uh, actually a professor of geology became eventually was John Mitchell who thought about many important and prescient ideas and he wondered about a star that was so concentrated that light could not escape from its surface. Um, this was actually unknowingly put into a formal uh, framework by Carl Schwarzschild, who at the time was a soldier in the First World War, and he took the newly minted Einstein field equation relativity and was able to solve them to show that there was actually a spherically symmetric solution and if we do what he in practice did not do and he passed away uh, sadly soon after doing this but if we if we take that argument a stage further you can discover the um an event horizon that's described by this famous solution and so with a little bit of historical license, uh, we can say that these gentlemen uh, rightly showed us the black holes in the ideas of a theoretical physicist, they can exist. We go on a little bit more historically, and uh, uh, several people, but notably Chandrasekhar and Robert Oppenheimer, thought about the properties of white dwarf stars and neutron stars, which are the other two types of compact objects. And they showed something rather important, which was that there was a maximum mass to these uh, white, to these objects. And, and as astronomy, astronomical stars were going to leave behind remnants that were more massive than these maximum masses, there was really no alternative to them continuing to collapse and form a black hole. And those black holes therefore not only can exist, they must exist according to what we see going around us in the universe and stars and so on. So that was again a great step forward. Um, now, the, the mathematical and physical development of black holes was prosecuted by many people in a, in a rapid time of discovery in the 60s and early 70s. Here are, uh, here's Roy Kerr, a New Zealander, who discovered how to generalize the structural black hole, and here's the so-called metric, which describes the geometry of a black hole that is spinning. I'm not going to interpret this equation, just say that it's not that long. Um, and it, has, it was an amazing mathematics discovery to find this. Um, here's John Wheeler, who, and with a team of people, thought a lot about their physical properties and the challenges they presented. Here's Roger Penrose, and I'll... Uh, if one of his many contributions in a short moment, and here's somebody else who needs no introduction, Stephen Hawking, who again uh, did um, research on the classical aspects of black holes as we see here, uh, but also took this forward into a quantum regime, which will not be part of my story today. So associated with this black hole is an angular frequency. So there's a spinning black hole. It's just not just spherically symmetric, it's actually spinning. And it has a, a parameter that describes it called A. The only thing you need to know for this talk is that I can get an angular frequency, a rate of rotation, a rotation period with this black hole, despite the fact that it has no fiducial marks associated with it. 
Um, uh, and one other thing, and this is what uh, Roger, Roger Penrose and the others understood, was that in the mass or the energy associated with the black hole, there's a part of it that's associated with rotation, and that part that's associated with rotation can be as much as 30% as of, the, of the energy associated with the mass of the black hole, and it is in principle by thought experiments extractable. And my contention here is that some fraction of it, perhaps a third or, or a half of it, is in practice extracted by magnetic field in these sources. So just to summarize this slide, black holes, they're, they're extraordinarily simple in the classical level. They have mass and spin, they have spin energy, and there's enough energy there in one of these black holes in the galactic nucleus to power the active galactic, the, the activity in the galaxy and in the region around it, as I described. And it can do this over the age of the universe. And it does it by two channels, basically. One of them is rotation, as which is what I'm going to emphasize here. And the other is what is having gas that accretes, that falls onto it and liberates its binding energy. Just like if you drop an apple on the floor, that apple will lose its kinetic energy and it will be converted to get a little bit hotter and converted into heat and so on. So uh, that is um, a very important part of black holes. Let me just introduce one other physical idea here. I think it's relatively well known, but I'll, I'll just repeat it here, is that there's a maximum uh, rate at which black holes can spin. But if you try and perform some thought experiment with uh, one, of your, one of your trusted colleagues being sent in a spaceship, around the black hole and just hovering outside the event horizon, then that, then that spaceship must orbit it essentially at the angular frequency of the black hole. It can't be at rest with respect to the distant stars. And the region within which it has to spin is called the ergosphere. And what Penrose showed, I'm going to go in a, in a very, very clever idea, was inside this ergosphere, this, this region here, there exist orbits which have negative total energy. They don't exist outside the ergosphere, but within the ergosphere they do. And so what that meant is if you did a bit of engineering outside the event horizon and put a rock onto an orbit with negative total energy and threw it into the, let it go into the black hole, then it would actually remove some of this rotational energy. And that was as a thought experiment, was a way of getting spin energy out of the black hole. So that's a, and so that's the key point is that in principle, it's possible to extract energy from, from a spinning black hole. And my contention is that's responsible for a lot of what we're looking at. Now, going back to the observations, I, I'm not going to uh, describe this in, in much detail, but in the early 1970s, people started to find evidence for black holes that were more massive than the maximum masses allowed by Chandrasekhar and Oppenheimer. In for, for, white, uh, for white dwarfs and neutron stars respectively, and they had all the properties of black holes. And furthermore, it looked like that they had disks around them that um, disks of gas, a bit like Saturn's rings, that were able to glow in particularly at X-ray wavelengths. And, uh, and then you were seeing the emission liberated by accretion rather than rotation. So you were seeing uh, the accretion mode, if you like. And uh, although people had thought about AGN as being black holes from the days of discovery of, of quasars, um, this was largely the time when uh, almost everyone accepted the fact that black holes really do exist, despite the disquietude that some physicists had with this proposition. Our galaxy itself, it doesn't have an active galactic nucleus, and we should be grateful for that. We wouldn't want to live next to a quasar, but here's the center of our galaxy. Seen in infrared here, seen in, in X-rays. Here is um, here are stars observed at infrared wavelengths, shown in orbit around a central mass. And you can see just like the planets in our solar system, they orbit a central mass, and that mass uh, is four million solar masses. It's a relatively modest mass compared with the mass that's associated with M87, which is six solar masses. And this is a nice image shown by the South African telescope I just mentioned, Meerkat. 
And this shows on the large scale what's happening in the center of our galaxy at radio wavelengths. And we see all these mysterious filaments and so on, which are almost certainly magnetic structure and supernova remnants and so on. So we're learning a lot about the geography of our galactic nucleus using these new radio telescopes. So we have uh, a black hole. We've measured its mass in our galaxy, a small one, and a large one in M87. And of course, there are many more that we know about. Here's another observation of our, of the black hole and its environment in our galaxy made with the gravity instrument at the ELT in Paranal. And uh, this again has been one wonderfully successful program. And there you can see magnetized clouds that are in orbit around this black hole at the center of our galaxy. And they're orbiting about every 45 minutes. And we're learning a lot by these observations. These new infrared capabilities are extraordinary. And this is interferometry at infrared wavelengths rather than at radio wavelengths, which is what we've just discussed. Black holes, of course, have been very famous recently because of the uh, gravitational wave observations using LIGO-Virgo and soon to be other telescopes as well being part of the act. Here's a simulation, I emphasize, of the merging black, first merging black hole discovered in uh, 2015. And you can see the final merger happening there. And so there we have a process that was observed using gravitational waves that was able to form a spinning black hole, albeit on the stellar scale. And although I won't, emphasize, I won't discuss this anymore, corresponding processes are strongly believed to be happening on the scale of an active galactic nucleus and their binary black holes with masses of millions to billions of solar masses occasionally merge by essentially similar processes and are observable, although that hasn't actually happened as yet. Moving on, as I emphasize, there's a range of masses involved. Here's a, a compilation of the measurements of the masses and they range, as I said, from uh, about a million or so solar mass. Here's the Milky Way, our galaxy, there's M87, and the rest, the champion in the Guinness Book of World Records is up there at about two, about 20 billion solar masses. Okay, so, um, so these, these are big beasts. Now, let's talk a little bit about the physics now. And I want to talk, go back to this business about gravity power. So if we go back to the accretion mode and imagine um, a well-known character from Greek mythology, Sisyphus rolling a 10 ton boulder up a 100 meter hill and then watching it roll downhill, that was his lot in life. It would release energy um, and the energy that it would release would be the same sort of energy you get from a much smaller amount of chemical energy with three kilograms of TNT or 300 grams of gasoline, alcohol or candy, choose your poison, or 100 micrograms of uranium or 300 nanograms of gas accreting onto a black hole. So the point about this slide is that the uh, accreting gas in, in in, in these accretion disks are orbiting the black hole can release an enormous amount of energy for a small amount of gas. It's extraordinarily efficient, much more efficient than nuclear power, and orders, and orders of magnitude more efficient power or mechanical power as we see up here. So with poor Sisyphus. So um, and roughly you can expect a rough, typically about 10% of the rest mass energy of the accreting gas being released in some radiant form, one form or another. And so let's talk a little bit more about this accretion power. And if we make the very simplest type of idealized description of this, we can imagine a disk of gas, make it flat and steady, have gas spiraling inwards under uh, friction. It's a bit like Saturn's rings, if you like, but with friction between adjacent rings. And that friction is caused by a process that we now think we understand. Uh, it's magnetic fields that go unstable. They provide this friction, and that friction causes the gas to move inwards. And if we make the very simplest model, the mass will be conserved, and what you supply up out here at large radius will go into the black hole at small radius. And not only will the mass be conserved, the angular momentum will be conserved. Angular momentum is a physical property. It's a sort of momentum of rotation. 
Um, and that should be conserved, and indeed we think it is here, and the friction balances the inflow of the gas, and you don't lose any angular momentum in this simple description. And the consequence of this is that there's an energy release. There's a lot of energy released, and there are three ways in which we think that energy might be released. The first is it will heat the gas in this disk, and because it's got hot, it will be able to radiate and shine, and that will be, for example, what goes on in quasars, where we get lots of bright ultraviolet radiation. And we believe that comes from the frictional heating of the gas in, in the thin, thin accretion disk like this. Another option that happens in different types of source is that the gas uh, heats, but it isn't able to radiate. And that means that it, because there's a lot of pressure there now, the disk will thicken. And this is sometimes called an accretion, uh, advection dominated accretion flow. And so we'll see an example of this in a moment, but there's believed to be a very thick accretion disk there. And basically the gas is still more or less conservative, but, uh, but it doesn't, uh, isn't able to radiate, but what is supplied goes eventually down the black hole crossing the event horizon. And then the third possibility, which is the one I shall advertise more here, is the possibility that the energy is released essentially all in form of an outflow and this disk launches a wind with using magnetic field and that is what my colleague Mitch Spiegelman and I once called an invection dominated inflow outflow solution and uh, this is an outflow that's driven by the energy that ultimately comes from the inner parts of the accretion disk and so the question is trying to understand which of these modes of energy release is important and where they are. Moving onwards, now we go from the accretion power to the rotational power. And, uh -huh. and here uh, in the rotational power, um, uh, this is Michael Faraday. And one of many, many things he discovered uh, is that if you had a conductor spinning in a magnetic field, and that's what you have here, then you can drive an electrical current around a circuit and light a light bulb. And you can do the same sort of thing with a black hole. You can regard it as a sort of conductor with a resistance of about 100 ohms. And if you stick it in a magnetic field and allow it to spin, you'll get electricity out, you'll get a voltage. Uh, those who have done basic undergraduate physics will be able to at least relate to this, this formula here that says the voltage is one zeta volt. And for those who aren't familiar with what zeta means, that means 10 to the power 21 or a billion trillion volts. That's an awful lot of um, batteries. And the current is again e equally enormous. And the magnetic field strengths are um, uh, uh, 10,000 times, say, or more times the sort of magnetic field that you're associating with the Earth. That's 100 times the magnetic field of a fridge magnet. And this whole process drives an electrical circuit and that electrical circuit carries, energy, carries power, and that power can power the most powerful active galactic nuclei and other objects beside. So here's a simulation of this. We've got magnetic field lines shown by these lines here. Here's a spinning black hole. Here's a thick accretion disk that surrounds it. And electromagnetic energy is extracted through a process that Roman Znayek was mentioned and I uh, thought about in the 1970s and is collimated and confined by the surrounding gas in this region here. So if we go on here. So let me talk a little bit more about the details of this means of extracting electromagnetic power. And this is a little bit of sort of physics here, but I've tried to remove all the equations and just explain qualitatively what the main points are. If one, just like in the spirit of that very simple model of the accretion disk that doesn't do full justice to the observations for sure, one tries to make again a, a simple, steady, uh, axisymmetric model of magnetic field uh, shown here, uh, threading a spinning black hole. So this is, imagine this stipple thing here is a spinning black hole. We've got magnetic field lines, that's these lines here like that and now are going to thread the horizon of the spinning black hole. And these field lines that are wrapped around the axis of rotation are going to 
lie in surfaces. We call these magnetic surfaces. So they lie in magnetic surfaces. Here's one surface. There's another surface. And so the claim is that by this sort of Faraday effect, you're going to drive electrical current along these surfaces. There's a voltage associated with these surfaces. And we can think of these magnetic field lines as rotating with an angular frequency that's about half the angular frequency of the spinning black hole. So we've got a black hole with an identified spin, as I mentioned before. And, uh, and then these field lines are going to rotate with about half that angular frequency. And that's going to send currents along these magnetic surfaces take energy and angular momentum outwards from the black hole along these magnetic surfaces. It's going to extract it from the black hole along these surfaces. And it's going to be essentially initially pretty much invisible because it's just electromagnetic energy and there's no way you'll observe that directly until it starts dissipating. Now you might be worried at this point and say, but I thought energy was supposed to go into a black hole. And yes, it is. If you were if you were an observer, as I mentioned before, in this thought experiment hovering just above the horizon with the angular frequency of the black hole, then what you would actually see is energy going into the black hole. But in this frame that's not rotating from the outside, you get energy coming out. That's the sort of magic of relativity, if you like. And um, so you can electromagnetic energy in this way from the black hole. And this sort of process also, I should say, works with accretion disks. So the standard way of thinking about this, and it's an old idea going back to the 70s, and uh, my colleagues, um, Martin Rees and uh, Stolfini and Mitch Beagleman and I, we sort of thought about this too in the early 1980s, and I think this is one of our cartoons, to imagine some very thick accretion disk here with a black hole in the middle, and then defining by its rotation, a pair of funnels with magnetic field in the middle of it. And this, re this uh, thick disk here is supported by the pressure of ions, protons of protons that are mildly relativistic with cooler electrons. And so what we have then is the confining region here, this giant donut, if you like, defining a pair of funnels. And inside these funnels outflows the jet, which is powered by the spin of the black hole. That was the conception, as I say, um, nearly 40 years ago. Um, and it is the basis of the sort of contemporary model. And I'm going to sort of segue into a, a sort of almost heretical view of what's actually going on in these sources. But let me put up the standard view, uh, first of all, and why I'm not so sure that this is what the these marvelous uh, observations made by the Event Horizon Telescope team uh, are actually demonstrating. So in the, the problem really is that um, in say in the Sajay star is the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the efficiency is something like about 10 to the minus seven. So it looks like we're getting a very poor return on the gas that's being supplied at large distance. And so, it's very, very surprising if that any of that gas is getting into the center because it ought not, it ought to be dissipating. Accretion disks are naturally extremely dissipative objects, and they ought to be very much brighter. In M87, we know that the jet that's observed is a hundred times or more more luminous than any power we see coming from the disk. So it looks like we've got something, the jet, when when we eventually see it, is extremely powerful. The disk is extremely faint. And that's very surprising because the problem is, can we have enough pressure here to confine these jets? These magnetic fields have to be confined and collimated by this thick accretion disk here, this giant donut, without actually seeing it. And this is a big, big puzzle. Let's continue. Um, let's give the standard view, and this may well turn out to be right, and a lot of thinking is going into this. This is made by the Event Horizon Telescope team themselves using numerical simulation. They made a model of emission with a certain set of properties from this giant donut, and they said this is what it would look like if you had perfect resolution, and if you then blur it with the actual resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope, which is truly impressive, you'll get something here that looks really rather like what was actually uh, observed. 
And so that's good. If we look at it not from the point of view of fluid mechanics, which these simulations were, but from the point of view of the individual particles, it's a rather nice piece of work that's done by Parfrey and others. They made a model and they show a current sheet here. But again, it's the same story. And uh, you have gas that's confining the jet and is the outflow. And here's, here's the black hole here. And this is a uh, a current that's flowing into the black hole in this particular model, making its sort of making its assumptions. And so my question is: Is this really the right model going forwards? And what I'd like to share with you is an alternative conception of what is actually happening in these sources. And um, so let's just go on to here. And I've got here a cartoon, if you like, that. Um, uh, contains the, the, the altern an alternative viewpoint. I've got, I'm going to show this in three different ways going forwards, but this is the sort of big picture, if you like. Firstly, the ingredients are there is a spinning black hole here. It's rapidly spinning. And imagine this is true in M87, but lots of other sources as well. It's a source where the supply of gas is very low, unlike in a quasar, where the supply of gas must be very high. The spinning black hole has an ergosphere, which we introduced before. This is the region where an observer must rotate in the sense of the hole, and from which you can, in principle, extract the spin energy of the hole. This is the black hole. And in this case, because it's a, um, back a moment, because it's uh, believed to be magnetized, these are magnetic field lines that in cartoon form thread the horizon of this black hole, and they are. Uh, spun around and make toroidal magnetic field and they send off an electromagnetic jet in this direction. The jet itself must be confined, this magnetic field must be held in place and the jet itself must be confined by something outside. And the conjecture here is that the, what is actually providing the collimation is a magnetic uh, region here, it's magnetic field, and you get magnetic field that extends way outside the black hole that provides the collimation of this jet. Ultimately, it has to be held in place by gas. And here the, here the story is that there is gas, there is an accretion disk, it's a much larger radius, and it's being observed in that event horizon telescope image. And in practice, the gas that is supplied at large radius is all ejected from this disk and that disk and that the power for that ejection is carried the gas is carried off in a, in a magnetic wind and the and that is energized by the spin of the black hole so energy comes from the spinning black hole all the way through this magnetic clutch it engages the ejection disk and all the gas that is supplied is given enormous speed and driven out from this, this so-called ejection disk. So it's an ejection disk, not an accretion disk. And there's an interaction layer that will start to develop up here. And this is what you start to observe schematically in those observations of the boundary layers of the jets. So just to summarize the basic point here, the, uh, the idea is that what is observed with the Event Horizon Telescope is magnetically dominated. There are electrical currents for which you need negligible amounts of gas. And the field lines thread the horizon and are rotated at about roughly half the angular frequency of the hole. And um, uh, energy and angular momentum are transported not just outwards along these field lines into the jet, but are transported outwards, as shown in this, in this cartoon here. This is the same cartoon, if you like. And the point is that the energy and the angular momentum that are liberated by the black hole are transported outwards as well as out along the jet like this. They also go outwards, and so they can power the outflow from this magnetic wind from the ejection disk. So this, this spinning black hole powers the ejection disk that carries away all the energy. And the means of doing this is relying on magnetic instabilities that operate in this region very similar in spirits to those 
that are uh, believed to take place in regular proper accretion disks, regular accretion disks where there are magnetic instabilities, and that is responsible for the friction of the accretion disks. The claim is that there is the same sort of friction that happens in this region here, which allows energy and angular momentum to be transported outwards and to power this ejection disk. Okay. So the idea is that there is uh, instability here, and these field lines here make this clutch. And what you're actually looking at with the Event Horizon Telescope is a magnetosphere, rather like in a pulsar, um, not a, a thick uh, ring of orbiting gas, as in the standard model. So here's the ejection disk, here's a magnetic wind here that's eventually the energy outwards. And this wind is responsible for shaping the, the jet as observed by the radio astronomers, and it also could be the source of emission line clouds. Um, the ideas that I'm sort of sketching here, they have some basis, but they're still somewhat conjectural, but they do have implications for many more types of source than those uh, that epitomized by M87. Uh, if I just take uh, another radio quasar, 3C279, it is an uh, amazing uh, source, uh, not the least for its gamma ray properties, and it is able to vary on time scales of three minutes. And this is a great puzzle because uh, the gamma rays that are seen can't, you'd have thought, can't come from very close to the black, to the black hole because there's a lot of ultraviolet radiation there. And those gamma rays react with ultraviolet photons, that, which will prevent their escape. So somehow or other, you have to shield those gamma rays made close to the black hole um, by gas on the outside. And the, the application, the ideas I've just sketched are to this source are that you uh, have a sort of sheath of gas that absorbs the ultraviolet photons. And when, a, when a, um, a, uh, uh, an astronomer looks right down the jet from this direction here, looks right down the jet, then it's able to see right down to a region where there aren't these reacting ultraviolet photons and the gamma rays can escape. So that's one of the story, one part of the story. Another part is that the so-called emission line gas for the astronomers who know all about this business, that's actually derived, that's the outflow from this accretion disk. So I'm not going to take this uh, any further here. Um, let me just say, we finish with the concluding slide, is that the future is very bright in this business. Uh, there are two major radio astronomy projects which will complement ALMA at lower frequencies. One is next generation VLA, which is a US version, and there's a more international version, the square kilometer array. I hope that sometime in the future that these will essentially merge into one effort as they are somewhat complementary as currently conceived. Um, in addition, gamma ray astronomy, which I have not done justice to in this talk, one of the Exciting things happening is the, uh, the South American Wide Field Gamma Ray Observatory, which is under intense discussion. I can't tell you which South American country it will be in, but I can tell you its altitude, which is very important. But it's a very exciting possibility because a lot of science is already being seen at these very high energy gamma rays. And then and if we consider the Event Horizon Telescope, in which ALMA is, as I say, the anchor, going out into space, uh, at millimeter wavelengths is a, is a dream of many of us. And then we'll have even better uh, observations of more and more sources. So my summary is basically, I hope I've been able to communicate that the evidence for black holes being the engines for active galactic nuclei and much else besides. Um, energy is released from accretion and rotation. And the spin appears to power the relativistic jets. And I tried to sketch how that might happen. I've conjectured that in M87, it could be an ergo magnetosphere, a construct of portmanteau word, if you like, that, uh, that the, the astronomers are looking at, not a thick accretion disk, and this has implications for quasars. And I hope two other things that have come out of this talk is the, the story is being told by astronomers working throughout uh, the electromagnetic spectrum and beyond, and the future is bright, not, not just for the observations, which are very exciting, that are coming, but also for the ability to do simulations and so on, and test some of these sketched ideas. 
I thank you very much. And I have to say, do keep yourselves well and, and pay attention to others in the same time. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me. And I'm very eager to uh, talk about questions, to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Roger, for this fascinating, beautiful overview. Um, we have quite a few questions. Um, there are a few questions on the panel, but I'm going to take my privilege of asking the first question. <laughs> um, there is something that is called uh, the ISCO radius, right? The innermost stable circular orbit that correlates in radius with the angular momentum of the black hole. So in your picture, would that mean that um, the faster that the black hole rotates, uh, the more efficient the jet formation and the inflow of material actually would be of feeding the collimation? Would there be a correlation expected there? Thank you very much. I'm glad, you, really glad you asked that question because it, as you appreciate it, will be brought up one of the points I didn't have time to make. If we go back to, um, I don't know whether maybe, um, can we, Go back to our, okay, this is the one, this is the one. Take this accretion, this, this thin accretion disk here. You'll see I've got actually got a gray hole in the middle for some reason, but it's a black hole. And then there's this region around it. And if you just imagine gas in orbit around this black hole, then it turns out that the circular orbits within this region here, are unstable and the gas in this region must just spiral rapidly into the black into the black hole so as thomas said there's an innermost stable circular orbit or isco for short and that in this particular cartoon would be at that radius there like that so that will be the innermost stable circular orbit now in the if you like the oversimplified classical not matching up to the job theory of thin accretion disks, then what you would say is the gas spirals inward, it liberates all its energy as radiation until it gets to that point, and then it just plunges into the hole and you don't get any more radiation out of it. Now, the location of the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit, depends on the spin of the hole. It is at uh, six times, it's at excuse me, three times the uh, radius in some coordinate system of the event horizon in a non-rotating hole, but in a prograde rotating hole going as fast as it can, it's essentially right on top of the horizon. It's not quite on top of the horizon, but it's almost on top of the horizon. So there, and, uh, and so you get a very efficient release of energy from that, from that region. Now, what I actually think is going on is that in the in the story that I told, you don't have a thin accretion disk like this. You have enormous transport of energy and angular momentum outwards rather than this passive uh, accretion disk here. And so the ISCO is essentially irrelevant to this story. And in the particular you know cartoon that I showed, if you like, and there's a bit more to it than that, uh, then the, any appreciable amount of gas is at a very large radius compared with the size of the black hole. And essentially everything that's supplied to the black hole is more or less everything, not all of it, but mo most of it is going to be driven away in the magnetic wind. And so in this particular type of source, in this particular type of model, the ISCO is not important. What is important is the ability to uh, trap magnetic flux within a much larger limiting radius and then uh, have that efficiently extract energy from, from the black hole. However, other types of accretion disks, particularly those associated with stellar sources, may well operate in this way. And then the ISCO is a very important concept and, uh, and you get more power out when you have a, a prograde spinning hole. So thanks for answering the question. I see that Conrad has a question. Conrad, would you like to go ahead? Yes, the, actually this, this question is almost related to where you were just finishing off now. So if I understood you correctly, you proposed that the formation of the jet is in, in AGN at least is driven by the extraction of energy from the rotating black hole in the ergosphere. So there, as you just mentioned, there's also other jets observed for non-relativistic objects like young stellar objects and so on. 
So do you think there is a way for us as an observer to find the difference between the jets driven by accretion disks and by black hole spin driven jets? Excellent question. You've, again, you've put your finger on one of these observational phenomenological choices that have been there for a long time. And I'm going to go forward, I think. Let's go to, the, let's go to this one. Yeah, that's right. So basically, um, those of us who saw these jets as being essentially magnetic or hydromagnetic or electromagnetic, take your pick, um, structures were faced with two choices. Either they were powered mostly, and again, you know, everything's, everything's present, but uh, for what is question what dominates, why well, they were powered mostly by the spin of the hole, in which case it was the field lines that came through the horizon of the black hole, um, or alternatively, they were, forget the black hole, say it's just not important, it's not spinning or something, they were powered by the magnetic field threading the accretion disk. And David Payne and I and many others thought about ways of taking the energy out of the gas in the accretion disk, taking it off in a hydromagnetic wind, and that, and that wind um, uh, is able to take away all the energy, and it could in practice be the jet itself. Now, I think most of us believe for two reasons that in the quasars with the with the relativistic outflows and so on, it comes from the, from the, from the black hole. Most of the power comes from the black hole. And that's, that's because you're seeing the rapid motions, the, you know, the ultra relativistic motions. You're seeing a highly evacuated invisible region, which you can get from a black hole, whereas this is going to be much more luminous. Um, and uh, observationally now, one's tracing the jets down to very tiny radii. They're not coming from accretion disks. Now that's the mechanism that's believed to happen in the AGN, but there are many sources, uh, low power AGN, protostellar disks, nobody says there's a black hole in HL tau. And so uh, that has to come from probably mostly the power for that must come at much slower speeds from the accretion disk. But even then, there is a possibility that you can have an analog of the black hole, say in a protostellar disk like HL tau, um, because if you have a slowly rotating star, and most of these protostars are believed to be relatively slowly rotating, there'll be a boundary layer here between the inner edge of the accretion disk and the star itself. And you could get a lot of dissipation there. So you could, be, you could have some crude analog of the operation of a black hole, but in a highly non-relativistic context in these other types of source. George Novi can do the same sort of thing. So thanks very much, Conrad, for the question. I have just, since you have the slide up here, just a conceptual question. Does the handedness of the magnetic field actually flip at the top of the graph here and at the bottom of the graph? Or oh, oh, wait a minute. The, um, the, the magnetic field lines, as shown here, are what I call dipolar, and so they continue from the bottom going up to the top in this representation. The toroidal field has this different pattern, um, and the alert amongst you may have noticed an advertising for a German motor company, uh, the three ingredients of magnetic field, mass, and angular velocity, for those who know how to translate uh, Greek into LaTeX. Um, and, uh, uh, and then this pattern here, of course, is the pattern of the toroidal field. So if we go back to this one here, now there are, uh, Nick Lovelace and I and others have entertained the possibility that the magnetic field could have a quadrupolar geometry, but for reasons I don't really have time to go into here, both observational and theoretical, this do, it looked like a good idea at the time, but it, I, I think it's not likely to be relevant now. All right, so we're going to continue with Eleonora. Yeah, thank you. So um, a question still related to the mechanisms, but trigger a jet, because anyhow, we can observe um, relativistic jet in a fraction of active galactic nuclei. 
uh, a relatively small fraction. So why this? Um, it depends, so it, it's a matter of just coincidence because of the conditions, the inner conditions of the environment surrounding the black hole, the conditions of the magnetic field and so on and so forth, or there is also an evolutionary component of these systems. I, I, okay, thanks. I, yeah, I, again, I, I think that is a large part. I, I mean, the answer is, is, as they say nowadays, yes, um, in the sense that both of those are important. Um, not every black hole makes giant powerful radio sources. That's pretty clear. This seems to be the province of the massive black holes in the centers of giant elliptical galaxies. Now, there are one or two exceptions to this, but that's almost all the really big powerful ones. But low power jets are quite common. I showed you the image from Meerkat with a, a, a billion of these things on the sky. And you could say there's some you know, there's the Fermi bubbles and other sort of evidence of bipolarity in our, our galaxy's black hole. Um, and that would not, if that were at the Hubble distance, that would not make the cut for Meerkat by a factor of about a thousand. So it's probably all AGN, all, all galaxies at some level have some black hole near their center and all of them probably make some bipolar activity. And, um, uh, so it's all a question of degree. Now, what happens in a particular source, let's take M87. You may think it's a very, you know, it was an early radio source. It was a great, powerful, wonderful discovery. From the, you know, the quasar perspective, it is truly pathetic. Um, it is a very low power source for a six billion solar mass black hole. There's almost, you know, five orders of magnitude less than it could have been in its heyday it would have been as bright as Vega in the sky. Our ancestors, if they were around at that time, and I'd had they were, um, would have been navigating by it. And it has enough, you know, and that's when it would have been providing essentially the heating for the major heating for the uh, cluster gas in the Virgo cluster. So, and its behavior and how it operates and how it radiated and so on would be quite different in that mode and that phase than it is today when it's a very, has a very low rate of mass supply. And I would claim that the mass that's actually getting into the center is, is you know, three, four, five, six orders of magnitude smaller than that's what's actually supplied at larger radius. I mean, some gas is always going to get in. It's not a, it doesn't need excluding and plasma is very slippery stuff. So it's always going to get in. But the contention is that in the case of M87 now, it was, it's, it's expelling most of the gas that's being offered to it. Whereas in a day when it was accreting at the so-called Eddington rate, it was, um, it was accepting most of that gas, taking its binding energy, making a prodigiously powerful ultraviolet and optical source from the accretion disk and so on. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a life cycle. It spinning up a black hole happens relatively fast compared with growing it because you've got angular momentum from gas at large distances. So it can happen relatively fast. If I can you know, continue. You can imagine something like M87 having gone a hundred times through some cycle. Sure. Uh, concerning the spin, do you think we are close to being able to measure the spin of a black hole in, a statistical, in statistical samples? And in case with which kind of facility? Okay, yeah, I, I didn't, I actually took the, <laughs> these slides out, but I'm so, I'm so glad you know, for asking this question. Um, we do ha have measurements, not just of the mass from using Kepler's, but we do have measurements of the spin. And some of them are a little dodgy in my view, but but there are some but there are ones that are, are looking very good. And one of them is to look at the accretion disks and look at the particularly the iron line seen at X-ray wavelengths. And that has a thickness which is believed to be and modeled to be a measure of the spin of the black hole. And to cut this this observational story short, what you have is 
evidence that many, not all, but many of these sources are spinning, not just spinning, but spinning almost as fast as they can. And that's the observational evidence. And, you know, it looked like a good story when it was first told from the X-ray observations. But as we've looked with more and more detail with X-ray telescopes, you can see lots of um, features that are interpretable as uh, lots of features that are uh, interpretable in terms of the uh, rays of light going close to the black hole, for example, um, time dependent behavior, so called reverberation mapping, uh, where you see a, a, a flash of X ray radiation illuminating the accretion disk, and then you see the response at a delayed time. These sort, this sort of sort of second order business seems to be fitting into the story. And so I, I, I trust, I, I was always quite trustful, but I'm even more trustful now that they're measuring very high spins. Ezekiel has a follow up question. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, Roger, for the magnificent talk. And also, uh, yes, is what I want to ask is basically a follow up on this. Um, also, statistically, I think uh, some sort of the Sultan argument, basically, when you integrate the accretion on an AGN and turn it into a black hole mass, you require a fairly high uh, efficiency. Uh, typical value is about 10%, but uh, more recent models can take it up to about 30% or so, which will require uh, statistically, as you say, very high spins on average. So it means that if that's the case, then it seems like a, a spinning black hole is basically present in most AGNs or more, or, or the most powerful AGNs, and yet only few of these sources have powerful, uh, powerful jets. And so it seems like the key difference is the presence of magnetic fields. And in that case, my question is, what do you think will be the relevant physical parameters in determining whether a magnetic field is present or not? What should we look for? Okay, well, thank you very much, Ezekiel. And uh, I, uh, I, I think, uh, again, that, that's a very good point. Let, let me just back up a little bit just to explain something, because I think it's Im important. Uh, and that you, you, you sort of alluded to the so-called Salton argument. And this was an argument that was this is sort of a very important argument that was given by Andreas Salton in now 30, 30 years ago. And, um, and basically he did something very, very simple. He said, let's just look at the amount of radiant light, mostly ultraviolet, that quasars over the whole sky make and what's the energy density associated with it. Then let's take the equivalent energy density or mass density, but E equals MC squared, so it's energy density of black holes. And let's compare those two. And he found that independent of the tortured histories of these, of these black holes, um, if you say that some fraction of the mass energy of a black hole, spinning or not, goes into radiant energy, that efficiency has to be pretty high. Now you can, it becomes a sort of messy observational astronomy business doing the details here and volumetric corrections and all of that stuff. But some people say it's got to be 30% efficient. Some people say you can make do with 5% efficient, but it's still pretty high. So you're not allowed the luxury of growing black holes invisibly. You want, you want those photons out just to account for what you observe as an astronomer. Now, some people have gone on to say, well, let's take the ISCO argument and take the spin energy of um, modestly rotating black hole, and you're going to get 10% out. I need more energy than that, therefore I have to tap the spin energy. Some people have actually said that. I'm not sure that's, I believe that's going on, but I'm not sure that's necessary quantitatively. You might say, well, does every spinning black hole automatically radiate by this mode? And the answer is, observationally no there are radio quiet quasars and some of them uh, and there are secret galaxies and so on are spinning rapidly and not making jets so there's some other factors in there that are telling uh, an accreting um, uh, spinning black hole whether or not to make a jet 
It may have something to do with history. My guess it has to do probably with cycling of gas in the in the accretion disk. I think one of the things that I'm very impressed by uh, is the association of um, uh, jet, uh, of these powerful radio sources with elliptical galaxies. And for me, I I might you know I actually wrote about about this in an annual review article with Tony Reedhead and Dave Meyer, and uh, there the thought is that in the um, in the elliptical like galaxies, the gas is being supplied at all latitudes. It's falling in essentially from some circumgalactic flow, and that provides a much better confinement of the magnetic field than what happens in a disk galaxy. And in a disk galaxy, the gas only comes in in the equatorial plane. And I think it's easier for the magnetic flux to escape that hole in the middle, as it were, when, when, it's, when there's a disk inflow associated with the spiral galaxy, say, um, than there is uh, in uh, accretion at all latitudes in an elliptical galaxy. So that's my current favorite additional factor or switch or whatever for answering that. But, but it, it, you know, this is a time of rapid discovery and Webb is going to tell us stuff. I mean, Webb, James Webb Trace Telescope is going to tell us things and we'll have a very interesting co conversation again and I hope in a few years time about this topic. So it's me. Um, I have two questions, one from uh, the audience, Natalia Moreira. So she's asking how do I discover that black hole has an electric charge? And, and following that question, what happened with the magnetic field once it's inside the, the black hole, or once it's it crossed the event horizon? Okay, uh, lovely questions. Okay, let me again, um, these questions are, are artfully addressing slides that I took out of, <laughs> out of the presentation. So thank you very much. Um, there, Roy Kerr and others actually discovered in the 1960s an additional generalization of the, of the Kerr solution for a spinning black hole. And it's one that had a uh, charge associated with it and, and its own magnetic field associated with charge inside the, the black hole. This is a wonderful solution. Um, like many of these constructs, it is a playground for for the febrile imaginations of theoretical physicists, and they have gone off to, you know, perform wonderful understand, get wonderful understanding of the interior geometry of these black holes. However, I believe quite firmly that they're a bust in in, a, in astronomy because what happens is if you have a gravitationally significant charge, not just a tiny one but a gravitationally significant charge in a, in a stellar mass or larger black hole, then um, it will immediately discharge. It can make electrons and positron pairs, just like lightning on the Earth, if you like, and that will immediately discharge itself. You can't build up that amount of charge anymore. You can do that on the surface of the Earth underneath the cumulus cloud. And so I think that uh, they're not a, of great interest for practical astronomical observation, but they are terribly important. Now, uh, that the, coroll the, the corollary of that is that when we talk about magnetic field lines threading the horizon of the black hole, and this is well defined mathematically, these are magnetic field lines, we can trace them, they head towards the horizon. And we can in fact go behind the horizon um, and see what's going on there. Um, then this is all sort of well-defined using so-called Maxwell's equations and Einstein's general relativity. You can do all that stuff. That field requires there to be a current, an electrical current outside the horizon that is the source of the magnetic field. Okay, so it, 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 isn't, it, it, it does require the disk, it does require the current in the disk to hold the field in place. So that is absolute, absolutely required. Now, if you ask, well, what's going on into the magnetic field within the horizon? And that's the question I think, I think was asked. And I wasn't actually going to talk about this, but since you've, since you've done it, um, it, was, it was one, one of the uh, things, actually, Roman Zanike and I were worried, worried about this very, very point. And I, I, I kept on using the word dissipation. And I said, we've got these flows of differentially rotating gas outside the horizon that ought to, dis that ought to be dissipative. 
it order heat very easily. And you have to work quite hard to prevent it from to imagine it's not going to radiate. So it's going to radiate very well. What happens inside to magnetic field lines inside the horizon? Well, it turns out you can trace uh, the magnetic field lines through a perfectly smooth geometry inside the horizon. And you can follow magnetic field lines with electromagnetic energy, uh, essentially in locally invisible, if you like, inside the horizon. You can do as the thought experiment. Before too long, you get to a point, long before you get to a central singularity, when all of this must break down and there must be an enormous dissipation going on. Now, if black holes, I like to say, are very respectable because um, all of the dissipation happens behind the curtain. There's, uh, the people have closed the curtain, that's the event horizon. And so, yes, there's a lot of um, dissipation happening there, but that dissipation is not seen because all of the, the gamma rays and the X-rays and so on that are made by this dissipation behind the event horizon, it's real, but it's not visible because it doesn't get out through, through the horizon. And uh, if you want to think about this by th this sort of electrical analog, we can think about this as the very simplest type of electrical circuit generated by the spinning black hole. That battery has a sizable internal resistance and it has a load that's comparable, that's essentially matched to it. And so we have an electrical current some of the dissipation happens inside the horizon and, um, and increases the mass of the whole, that's an inefficiency, and some of it happens outside making gamma rays and radio waves and all the rest of it ultimately, and outflows. And there are probably cosmic rays too. Okay, so I have a few questions from the audience. So the first one is from uh, William Freights, who's asking, would it be possible to harness the powerful energy being released from these black holes uh, to develop more efficient space travel? Ah, oh, yes. Well, uh, first catch your black hole, I think, is the answer to that question. Um, uh, uh, I think we, we'd... Uh, I've had a few suggestions in the mail uh, from time to time, uh, from time to time, of uh, using black holes for solving energy problems and all the rest of it. Uh, wonderful, but of course, making one is not easy. Um, and uh, so the answer is a practical method: no, uh, because we we don't have one, one, one to hand, as it were. So we have to um, uh, make do with um, lesser forms of propulsion. In fact, ideas of using um, nuclear power was scotched for environmental impact and I have to believe the black hole environment impact state would, would be even more hazardous. Um, we have another question from Jorge Quadra. Um, how can we distinguish whether the EHT image corresponds to the ergosphere or the disk? Would the inferred black hole properties be different? Um, lovely question. Um, the second answer is um, the back up of no. I don't think not 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 seriously. I, I mean, you could, you get some differences, but not much. The re, I, for me, the the difference is is the polarization, and when you what you're looking at uh, in the ergo magnetosphere interpretation is you're looking at a current sheet without a lot of gas around. So there isn't an effect called Faraday rotation that's operating. In the case of when you've got a thick torus, if you're looking through that torus as an appreciable amount of plasma then, then you'll get a lot of Faraday rotation. And so I don't quite know what the, you know, what, I, I don't know what the EHT um, observations are, or indeed I don't, don't quite understand what their, their, their simulations are showing, but naively I would have thought with the sort of densities of gas and magnetic fields that are, one might expect, then there should be a lot of polarization. So I, for me, I think the uh, prescriptive way of deciding between these two very, very different views, both of which you know, could be right, um, uh, is, to, um, is to think about the upcoming polarization observations. High resolution will help too, of course, if, if you get Greenland as, as a, as a, as a north-south baseline, uh, then that will also, and you can go to 0.8 millimeters. I mean, again, you're getting a significant improvement in, in resolution. 
so I see Jonathan has also got his hand up. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so my question is related with the multi-messenger era. So how the current and uh, the future gravitational waves and neutrino detectors could improve our knowledge about black holes? Uh, what we can expect in the next decades, years? Oh, oh I, 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 I missed one word there, but I think um, at the start, but it, it's essentially what you can expect coming for, going forward. Yeah. Um, I think some of this depends on how patient you are. Um, uh, I think, you know, the, the real glint in the eye dream that one would have is to do really long baseline, that means out in space, a millimeter or some millimeter, dare I say, um, VLBI and getting really detailed imaging. That's long, long term though, I think. Um, in the more immediate future, we're learning an awful lot from the gamma rays. Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope taught us a lot. These, these jets are, you know, are very common as gamma ray sources and far more powerful. And then going up to um, uh, higher energies from, say, GV to TV gamma rays, the, a lot has been learned from from Hess, Magic, Veritas, and other sources, but the future of that business are in on in the air, in the Air Cherenkov department is um, is is essentially close to Alma, where the Cherenkov Telescope Array will be sited, and then if we go to the Water Cherenkov technique, which is sensitive to even higher energy gamma rays, going up towards the PV range, then there. Uh, a large part of the future, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, will be this SWGO facility that's being proposed. I'm excited about that. Um, the other, the other thing that I didn't really mention, uh, but you know, it ought to be launched in a few years, is um, and it's been delayed, obviously, because of coronavirus and so on. Is James Webb Space Telescope? Now, it's not going to be imaging. It's not going to be imaging black holes. Don't, don't get uh, that idea. However. It is going to tell us a lot about the the evolution, the sort of sort of issues that came up in an earlier question, and the environmental context of these black holes, and being able to understand, if you like, almost calorimetrically, how much power they're producing and when they're producing it, how much intermittency there is, and so on. And spin is a large part, I can I, I contend, of the life history of a black hole. It's uh, it's going to essentially increase its mass, um, it's certainly it's irreducible mass, but the spin is going to go up and down all the time. And how that actually does that and describing that statistically, I think is a, a challenge that has been largely interesting conjecture in terms of, you know, in terms of theory so far, but I think that can get um, interpreted by observations, especially those that, that may come from uh, from Webb and, you know, and, and the X-ray telescopes of the future as well, yeah. Uh, Brian has a question. Hey, thank you. Um, recently, we've detected billion solar mass black holes and galaxies at redshifts of seven and a half, which means about 700 million years after the Big Bang. Do you have any thoughts on how you get a black hole that big that fast? Um, uh, I'm, I'm of the, I, I belong to the school that is not worried by that. Um, I think it's easy to grow black holes quickly. Um, and I think when they when they get up to their maximum, say billion solar masses or so on, I think then there may well be limitations. But if we wanted to grow them to a million, 10 billion, a hundred billion, say very fast, given the right conditions, I think it is, it is not such a challenge, to be honest. And people have said, well, there's the saltpeter rate and you're limited by that and it has to tunnel through from an early universe or something crazy. I, I, I don't think that at all. Uh, one key physical um, uh, way of looking at this is if you can make the so-called trapping radius, which is the radius at which the radiation in the, is, uh, diffusing out of the gas slower than it is being carried inwards by the inflow. 
that's the so-called trapping radius. If you can make that larger than the Bondi radius, and it's not hard to do that for low mass black holes, then essentially everything just accretes in and we, aren't, we don't have to respect the Eddington limit. In practice, I think we already know that we're not respecting the Eddington limit in, in several of these sources. And uh, I'm, I'm not so shocked by that. Other people are, so you're ask, probably asking that question of the, of the wrong person, but I, I don't see that as a great challenge. Um, how it actually does this, in particular in the neutron stars, I think is, is, is a lovely puzzle, but it, I don't think it's sort of flying in the face of basic physics, for example. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's take our final question from Alejandro. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Dr. Blanford. Uh, this question is probably not relevant uh, for the universe we are living on now, but it bothered me for a, quite a while. Uh, a universe uh, in, as we thought with uh, before the end of the 20th century, with a large energy density will go back to collapse. And there was this um, possibility of universe that were like a bouncing universe, uh, universes. And my worry was what will happen with the millions and millions of black holes, enormous black holes that we have in a universe in a big crunch, what they will do? How do, will they behave? in that condition of extreme uh, approach? Oh gosh, um, uh, I, I, I mean there are highly speculative cosmologists associated with Roger Penrose and others uh, that have addressed some of these points. I, 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 I'm, I, I see no mo strong motivation for that. I, I, I think the limited view of cosmology is the one that's described by the so-called standard model. And, you know, essentially we're now um, uh, in an accelerating phase driven by a cosmological constant. It's natural to speculate what the, uh, what the context for that is, what the environment is, what one, and so on, all these sort of obvious questions come up. Uh, and there, the notion, you know, the notion that some people entertain is that you know there is a sort of much larger multiverse, and uh, different parts of it have different physical conditions. Some of them, which you know, the as you said, in, in some other universe other than the one we actually inhabit, um, uh, that maybe maybe there is a turnaround. Then uh, then I think it would be a little bit like what happens with you know, classically at any rate, let's just say this is classical statement I'm making here with things falling into a black hole. Um, you can, you know, take the domestic garbage or copies of the Astrophysical Journal or the Physical Review and you can throw them into across the event horizon of the black hole and it, it's all the same as far as the mass and spin are concerned. Quantum mechanically, the, there's a difference and there's, that's an interesting puzzle, but classically that would be like that. So I suspect you know, if there were some big crunch and some big final singularity in some other universe other than the one we appear to inhabit, um, then it probably would be indifferent to the fact that one black hole was spinning and another wasn't, for example. I don't think that would be a, an issue. That, But uh, I, I'm sort of off, off, probably off my level of confidence here, and I'm not sure who, who, is, uh, who is confident. Okay, thank you very much. There is one, actually there are several questions in the Q&A um, that go in exactly the same direction. So I wanna, I wanna collimate them into one question. Okay, yes. <laughs> one collimation. So, You'll use your magnetic personality to do this. <laughs> so Frederick Rantakiro and Hans Zinnecker have a very related question. So Hans Hi, is- Hi, Hans. <laughs> yes. Hans is asking a, um, a detailed question about the difference between um, accretion mechanisms in, in protostars around the protostellar environments and AGN. So the, in the protostellar case, the jets, is a, well, the jets are heavy fluids, while in the AGN case, 
it's a light fluid basically piercing the environment and the gas. So what, what is the collimation mechanism? What are the differences and similarities between these two scenarios? I, um, the similarities, um, I basically believe, and I'm going to use that word believe because I think we're at a stage of the investigation, which Hans in particular has been one of the people who's pioneered all of this, um, where you can't sort of say it has been shown that. But I believe that these jets, when all said and done, they're all essentially magnetic one way or another. It's the pinch effect and so on. Now, how that's actually implemented is, I think, quite idiosyncratic to the different sources. I'm taking 3C279, a mighty optical quasar, and taking one of the um, protostellar jets. They're very different objects, and I suspect, um, I suspect that you know most of the power comes not from not from close in but at larger radius than the protostellar jets and uh, not not at the outer radius but it comes from further out in the disk and how the how this happens depends on a lot of you know gymnastics with how the magnetic flux distributes itself in the disk that has you know has has you know some version of the magnetorotational instability operating but it's not as good there because there's a lot of the disk is neutral and not conducting but you know some version of that happens but I suspect that you know ultimately the common element is having these angular, you know, it's 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 BMW, it's it's magnetic field mass and angular velocity, and having those together are what you actually need to create these very common outflows, which happen in gamma ray bursts, they happen in merging neutron stars, they happen in AGN, they happen in proto stars, they happen in supernova remnants, for heaven's sake. You can probably find one in the sun if you look hard enough. But I mean it's you know, I think this is what you're actually looking at. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up, I think. Evelyn. Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much to everyone for joining us uh, today for Roger's talk, and thank you to Roger for taking the time to tell us about your work and answering all our questions. So all the talks in this series will be added to the Astrophysica UC YouTube account in the coming days, both with the English and Spanish soundtracks. Um, these videos will have higher quality than the live, live stream and we understand that there were some problems with the Spanish channel for today's talk so we'll do our best to improve the quality of the sound for the YouTube recording. Our next talk will be next week on the 14th of August. We will have Mike Nolan telling us about the OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission um, and so there's nothing else left to say except see you all next week. Ciao. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>